Where are you? I'm with bed 73. I'm just going to bed 73. I don't want to be a number when I'm a patient. The essential thing is that we actually keep the person at the centre. They're in the driving seat. It's very difficult to get doctors to be able to come to the discharge planning meetings due to their heavy caseload. So let's try and problem solve. Let's try and recreate it. The thing that staff have to remember about patients is that they are individuals. It's about human interaction, human skills, understanding the needs of the person. The most vital aspect is about reconnecting people to why we come to work in the first place. I would say that passing the baton is a manual of common sense rather than lots of technical jargon. Health and social services provide care and support for thousands of people every year. Meeting people's needs in line with their human rights is becoming ever more complex and challenging. And as a result, meeting those needs has to be planned and coordinated, like a journey. Many things can affect how the journey is planned, such as workload, a department's culture, or simply a lack of knowledge. Passing the baton, devised by frontline health and social care staff exclusively for their colleagues and peers, advocates and reconnects us to our core values and reminds us why we practice and care for people. The metaphor of passing the baton is simple. To produce the best performance, a relay team depends on a good plan, dedication to training, and the development of trust between team members. Each runner is responsible for carrying the baton to the best of their ability. At the right time and in the right place, the baton must be passed to the right person. The baton itself is a metaphor for the responsibility to care. In order for people to experience a smooth journey through health and social care, everybody has an important role to play. It is the simple things, done consistently by everyone and driven by our professional values, which can and do make a difference to people's experience. For all of us working in health and social care, it's very important that we recognise when we're holding the baton. And while we're holding the baton, doing everything that we can, reliably and consistently, to ensure that when we pass the baton, it's to the right person, at the right place, at the right time. If we do this, we will ensure that the individual at the centre of care will have the best possible chance of a healthy and fulfilled life. The baton is a really important symbol. It doesn't stand for the patient. It stands for the responsibility to deliver care. That responsibility in the first instance is the patient's. Occasionally, they may pass the baton to their family or carers to support them. And in some instances, they pass that baton to practitioners in health and social care. In the best instances, we pass that baton back at the end to the patient. The Change Agent team run a number of forums called Communities of Practice, and we bring together motivated health and social care practitioners from across Wales who are particularly interested in a certain area of care, for example, discharge or intermediate care. When we bring them together, they have a lot of tacit knowledge, they have a lot of experience, they have a lot of insight and perspective about the discharge and transfer of care process. And we felt, and they felt as well, that they could capture all this together in the form of a guide, a toolkit, a resource that could benefit their fellow health and social care practitioners to feel more comfortable and more confident about engaging in the discharge or transfer of care process. And that output is passing the baton. The Knowledge Barometer can benefit all parties involved in discharge planning. And it does that by helping everybody reflect on their own knowledge and skills, whether you're a service user, whether you're a carer, or whether you're a practitioner. It helps everybody understand what's required to ensure that the baton is passed effectively. The Knowledge Barometer has eight levels. Level one, the novice, and level eight, the expert. Now, it doesn't mean to say that if you're a junior practitioner, that you're at level one, and it doesn't mean to say that if you're a senior manager, you're at level eight. It all depends on your knowledge and skills in respect of discharge planning. It all depends on your experience, your day-to-day -day experience of managing discharge. A junior practitioner might indeed be planning discharge for somebody with very complex needs on a day-to-day -day basis. 
and that means that they may find themselves at levels 6, 7 or 8. However, a manager might manage an area of practice but may not be familiar and may not have the skills in respect of managing complex discharge. And so they may find themselves at levels 4, 5 or 6. The knowledge barometer is not just a theoretical tool. It's a tool that should be used in everyday practice. It should be used by the bedside to ensure that the baton is passed effectively, that the baton isn't dropped at any stage because you as a practitioner have a knowledge gap. The knowledge barometer can help you look at your knowledge and skills in respect of the discharge planning for that patient and then help you to understand what knowledge you need, what skills you need to fill those gaps effectively. Passing the baton is underpinned by six core principles that are essential to effective discharge planning. Communication, coordination, collaboration, consideration, creativity, integrity. They must underpin the way we work if we are to meet the needs of people who require our care and services. It's very important that we are aware that um, the person we're working with has complex needs and in order to ensure that those needs are met, the people involved with the care must communicate effectively in order to make sure that the care that is given is appropriate to that particular person's needs. The next of the principles is, is coordination. Now, in a multidisciplinary setting, anybody, anybody within the team can act as a coordinator, but people need to have defined roles. So people, whoever coordinates the meeting or whoever coordinates the team knows that certain things are going to be carried out by certain people and that the care that is necessary, the discharge planning, the communication can be coordinated in an effective way to push forward uh, discharge planning. Collaboration to me means working together effectively. Um, perhaps I like to think of um, collaboration as each member of the MDT acting together in concert as a sort of an organism so that we function together seamlessly and everything that's necessary to be done happens so that we can deliver the appropriate care at the right time and leading to timely discharge for the individual in question and the individual concerned. I mean I think that there are two elements in a way to consideration. It's consideration to one another as, as colleagues and understanding where the, the pressures are or the constraints are with different professionals, but consideration for the, the person as an individual and an acknowledgement that they actually are at the centre of this. It isn't about us achieving targets or performance, it's actually about making sure that the care that the person receives is what they need. The next principle is creativity, but I like to think this is problem solving. I think they shouldn't be, we can't, we shouldn't, it's not safe, the families don't like it. Let's listen to what we say before in the other principles. Let's listen to what the patients want. If we can try and get them home, it should be our default position. That should be what we should be doing. And if, we, if there are uh, obstacles or seem obstacles, let's try and problem solve. Let's try and be creative. Can we do something to overcome those obstacles? In our relationships with our colleagues and also with the clients, it is very important that we maintain professional integrity at all times that we undertake the appropriate assessment, that we develop the care package that is required, that we do what we said we were going to do. And by doing this, we will have maintained good relationships with our colleagues, with the client, and ensure that the care that they get is what they need. As a discharge team, we are there to help the patients make their decisions in regards to um, their journey through the hospital and back home again. We are there to help you and your families make decisions and to also ensure that the appropriate people are involved in your care at the right time. We become involved with the ward staff who will then identify patients that may need our 
input to ensure that we have got a link of communication between all those relevant disciplines that are helping to make that a smooth journey for the patient. When patients come into hospital nowadays, they very often present with a very complicated mixture of medical, of cognitive problems, of social problems, um, and of maybe family difficulties, housing difficulties. So you can't take the patient's medical problems and fix those without asking early questions about how we're going to get this patient out of the hospital bed and home where they want to be. I suppose the biggest complaint that, that we would have is the, is the idea of the care package, what the patient is really going to need when they get home. Lots of people, lots of patients are desperate to get back to their own homes and will say anything to get out of hospital. So it's a question of really drilling down so the patient has to confront, will they be able to manage at home? Because Valinja um, is a tertiary centre and we cover um, South East Wales, a lot of our patients come from a long way away. Um, so discharge planning is quite difficult because we involve a lot of the community staff, such as um, social workers and occupational therapists and district nurses, um, who are based um, often um, miles away and um, because they're going to be involved in their care um, after they leave, they need to be involved in the assessment and planning before um, they become discharged. So um, it often takes a while to organise um, discharge planning meetings and case conferences because um, we have to get everybody in the same room together. Um, so it's often frustrating for the patient having to wait for that to happen before discharge is um, planned. The value of the discharge planning must not be underestimated. It should and must commence from day one when the patient is admitted. The important features of discharge planning are good communication and good teamwork. Whether the patient is discharged home or discharged into another environment, it should be seamless and it should feel as part of a good process of care in which there are better outcomes for the individual. Effective and open communication is the most important tool we have when it comes to supporting people on their journey through care. For the many staff who work together to provide care, it is essential that they communicate effectively, not just amongst the professions, but also with the patient, their family and carers. An open and positive relationship with patients, families and carers can make preparation for and expectations around discharge easier. In the same way, strong communication links within and between teams can help to build trust, which is invaluable in complex or difficult situations. Where communication is at its best, teams can come together to plan and facilitate a safe and smooth discharge for everyone. If we see ineffective care is dropping the baton, as in any really race, then you apply that to a healthcare team looking after a given patient. Then it's about the communication networks that are in place. Dropping the baton means ineffective care to the patient. It means that professionals mistrust each other and it can lead to blame culture across organisations and across professional divides. That has a negative effect on patient care and the patient, their families and carers are confused as to what care they need when they need it and in what place. So ensuring the baton is passed across health and social care communities is paramount if we are to give effective patient care. One most important thing about discharge planning is communication um, across patients and um, professionals, um, especially the medical team. Um, from my experience working in a range of hospitals, it's very difficult to get doctors to be able to come to the discharge planning meetings due to their heavy caseload. So if they are involved, it actually speeds up discharge planning, as we know then the actual date that they're medically fit to be discharged so that everyone can work towards that. Doctors come, they t talk to you as a patient. Physios come, they talk to you as a patient. The domestic comes, she talks to you as a person. Nurses come, they talk to each other. I got fed up of being bed 7-3. Where are you? I'm with bed 7-3. I'm just going to bed 7-3. I have got a name. I've been in the army for 30 years. I'm used to being a number. I don't want to be a number when I'm a patient. 
Dignity is definitely not a buzzword. It should be key to everything we do within Care Pathways today and tomorrow and forever. Families dealt with in a dignified manner will be an outcome of this whole process of discharge planning. When a patient comes into hospital, um, some, sometimes they're very anxious and to help build up that rapport and that trust and that empathy with patients, for example, a very simple um, example of good practice could be that the patient may have a number of different family members and perhaps just identifying the names of those individual family members um, behind perhaps the patient's bed or nearby where um, the multi-agency team perhaps throughout the day and throughout the patient's stay visit and communicate with that patient. Knowing those names can help to make it much more personable and develop that relationship with our patient more quickly and effectively. The importance of that is to find out all the necessary information about that patient, their home circumstances, so the care that's being delivered is much more effective, it's planned to enable a safe discharge for that patient home by having the right information and planning the right services for that patient when they're discharged. There's an awful lot of patient information um, gathered by various professionals um, that needs to be shared in order to arrive at a point where everybody has the right information about the patient, the family, their needs, their expectations, so that we can then make a robust plan um, and execute that so that the patients move forward in their journey in a timely way. The ripple effect of ineffective communication can be widespread. For organisations, it may mean court cases, involvement of solicitors, or long, lengthy discussions with other care providers. Communication needs to be simple, clear, and concise. And if we can all do that across our professional boundaries, in all care settings, then we know the patient will receive the best possible care. People admitted to hospital have a broad range of needs. They could receive care for less than four hours in an A&E department, or for much longer if their condition has an impact on their existing lifestyle. A person-centered approach to assessment, taken from a number of perspectives, ensures that their individual needs can be understood and provides a focus for planning how these needs are to be met. Assessment should be a continuous process that helps us understand the life of the person prior to assessing our services. This picture of a person and an understanding of their current situation will help us plan for discharge and, where appropriate, signal the need to take prompt action to resolve issues or problems prior to them being discharged or transferred between services. I think the two main issues we need to address is the rising age of the population that we are going to be serving in the future. Also, uh, we are also aware that there are chronic long-term conditions which need to be managed better. Looking into these two major aspects, the most important uh, we will need to take into consideration is the comprehensive needs assessment, which does not does just look at the health uh, care needs of the individual, but health, social care, functional issues, including the environment, and the, uh, and the housing. And also, we need to look at what uh, the, the care for the carers who, ma who will be managing uh, these, these individuals in the community. Assessment is really very important for um, the individual and for the team. What you really need to do is to go back to the four Ps as has been highlighted in past in the baton. And what we really want, first of all, is to know a bit about their past history. What, what could they do before? What happened to bring in the hospital? What were the problems then that we could start to think about as they've come to hospital from the beginning to help affect a timely discharge? Because all too often what has happened is that in the serial silos have gone from ward to ward to ward and this previous assessment is just not taken account of and it leads to a, an increased length of stay. As a physio, I think it helps my role as a discharge coordinator in the fact that I can assess patients' physical function um, to determine their rehab potential um, and kind of discuss with the, the patient themselves, relatives and the MDT to decide the most appropriate place for discharge. 
and um, for example they may need further rehabilitation to become more mobile before they go home if that's important to the patient um, or if it's not important to the patient um, and they want to go home maybe if life expectancy is short then we can focus on um, kind of working closely with the occupational therapist to um, adapt their home to their current capabilities. The essential thing is that we actually keep the person at the centre, they're in the driving seat and sometimes that's not terribly comfortable for us as professionals or for even family. They may well want to go back to what we actually perceive to be a rather risky situation, it could be their environment, it could be their house isn't safe, but it is our responsibility as a team working with them in partnership to actually come to a solution that we make it as safe as is possible and that they are able to return to the place where they want to go to. When a patient comes into hospital or when they're on the verge of coming into hospital, we describe them sort of failing at home, you need a picture of everything that's going on. You need to know what family there are, what past medical history there is, you know, whether patients are expected to look after another elderly relative who whilst they're in hospital is now failing at home. And to get that information as early as possible actually doesn't complicate their management, it simplifies it. Because you're, you are, you've got a picture of a patient as a whole. I, I hate to use the word holistic, but it's, it's true. They're a person, and you know, they're not just an acute medical problem. Um, and you may prevent other admissions if there's a, an elderly spouse. You may actually simplify the discharge process if the patient turns around and says, no, it's no good, I'm going home on Thursday or there's a bed crisis, all those things can be, if it's done early enough, we shouldn't have the crisis of Mrs. Bloggs wants to go home at four o'clock on a Friday, oh my word, you know, that's gonna be a big disaster. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's not, you're not asking people to do lots of extra work. It's just a few simple questions while they're having a wash in the morning, while the physio's taking them for a walk. You know, none of it is really difficult and it's just a matter of getting a bit of background of the patient really. All we want to do is try to prevent what the patient doesn't want, and that's to come back into hospital. They want a timely discharge so they can go home, they can be safe, and they can stay home. So as part of multidisciplinary working, we need to identify all the problems that we need to have overcome, to have solved, for them to stay at home um, safely, and involve whoever that may be, the carers, the family. But you mustn't lose sight of the family. I think a lot of people make medicalise this professionalise this and don't use the family enough and the family actually, actually want to be involved. They may not be able to be there 24 hours a day but they often want to be involved and we need to facilitate that as part of effective discharge. And once you've got family and the patient aboard, prevent is likely to be almost 100%. With our age group of patients, the elderly, they're frail. We are going to see people coming back in and it's not necessarily a failure. As long as all the four P's have been taken into account, I think we've set the scene for the uh, safe and um, long-lasting discharge. I believe that the multidisciplinary team meetings need to be far better structured. That is where all the professionals come together so as to uh, uh, having assessed the patient in a comprehensive manner to be able to set goals. Once the goals are set, they should be shared amongst all the individuals which form the the membership of the team and there should be very clear communication channels between the teams themselves that there is no confusion and with the patient and their carers taking patient choice into consideration. When we were developing Passing the Baton um, a member of the team brought in a quote that's really struck a chord as we've gone around the country promoting Passing the Baton and it's attributed to Gandhi and the then Bombay Hospital. So basically the motto says the patient is the most important person in the hospital. He's not an interruption to our work, he's the purpose of it. He's not an outsider to our hospital, he's a part of it. And we're not doing him a favour by serving him, he is doing us a favour by giving us an opportunity to do so. Um, and I think the reason that struck such a resonance as we've gone along is I think that's probably what we all signed up for when we decided to come work in the health service. The problem is, I think, that certainly if you ask patients and carers if that's their experience, we can't guarantee that that's always the case. And when you talk to staff, what happens is the busyness of the day and the hustle of bustle um, almost makes us forget that. And that's the very bit that gets squeezed out when really that's the most important thing both to us and to the patients. Mm -hmm.
For a person with complex needs, an individualized care package can only be designed following a thorough and timely assessment of the person concerned. And this must also involve their family and carers. There are a number of diverse elements to consider when helping people to make the appropriate choices. And practitioners must ensure that patients, carers and those involved in the next stage of the discharge process are all in a position to make informed decisions. However, it is the person receiving the care that must be at the centre of any care planning, with their views, thoughts and wishes paramount. Carers and patients must be part of the discharge planning process and they need to be seen as key partners and part of the overall team. Whole team approach means involving carers and patients at a very early stage in the discharge planning. The benefit for the whole process of involving the carer is that from the start that they are, their role is recognised and that they, they are respected as equal partners in the whole process and what they have to say is listened to and respected. That way you get a really positive outcome because the whole team approach, everybody's input is respected and you get a very positive plan which will work for the patient in the community. The thing that staff have to remember about patients is that they are individuals and that they're not just a group of symptoms then, that they are treating. Particularly with chemotherapy, you tend to think chemotherapy, this is big, you know, scientific stuff. But there is a patient with basic needs at the end of this. And to bear that in mind. Something as simple as a fall can result in a life-changing event for an individual patient. The goal is to return a patient to independent living as soon as possible. That will involve an assessment of a patient's needs, involving the multidisciplinary team, the patient themselves, the patient's family and carers, to put in place individual and creative solutions, which could involve the patient's general practitioner, district nurse, reablement teams, social workers, domiciliary care agencies, to be able to return the patient to independent living within their community. When we're planning care for a person to be discharged from hospital, one of the biggest problems that we sometimes have actually is sheer accessibility. If the person needs domiciliary care and they live in one of the upland villages, for example near Tregaron, you can be talking about an hour and a half car journey there. Now that's fine if the weather's good, but obviously whether that care is actually sustainable in the winter if there's a frost on the road or if there's a road traffic accident. So we really do need to plan very finely what is actually going to happen to that person if something were, were to go wrong. Come the day of discharge we're all very happy. There's a high degree of the expectation that patients longing to get home but we want to make sure that they get home safely. So we want to hand over the baton. We want to make sure that they don't fall the net, through the net when they get home, that the appropriate people involved are involved. That could be just the family that keeping an eye on the individual. It could be the wider MDT, it could be the GP, it could be the district nurses, the carers. As long as the, the patient feels safe and secure, we'll have an effective discharge. Managing the legal responsibility for an individual or their needs is a complicated area of practice and obviously requires a good deal of expertise. On a day-to-day -day basis, the legal issues pertaining to an individual case can seem remote from the process of delivering care. Nevertheless, if practitioners have adhered to the core principles of discharge planning, then any possible legal issues will be less intimidating. The key essentials outlined here will help everyone to feel more comfortable and confident with discharge or transfer of care planning. The group in designing Passing the Baton decided it would be a good idea to have seven key principles which should remain at the forefront of everyone's mind when planning a discharge process. This means that um, there's an overall pattern of a good approach to designing a discharge plan in a situation where the rights of the individual remain at the forefront. Everyone wants to avoid a legal dispute. When relatives and patients and professional staff are at standoff, the situation deteriorates and 
uh, people become entrenched. The whole point is to avoid a dispute occurring in the first place. And we believe that following the key principles will mean that the situation never develops where people are feeling aggrieved and concerned that their rights haven't been properly recognised. Remember the person at the centre. The patient will feel isolated and vulnerable if the process develops a life of its own. In that situation, the patient needs constant support and may well need advocacy if they do not have someone close to them to give them advice. It's about the patient, it's not about the process. The third key essential is communicate, communicate, communicate. Indeed, you can't communicate enough. The process is complicated, particularly where you're looking at different rights and obligations and the interface between the rights to healthcare and social care. We are finding that people don't understand what is happening to them and what their rights are. For that reason, throughout the process, time needs to be taken to explain exactly what policy is being followed and what the effect will be on the patient and on the carers. Key Essential 4 is about understanding the principles of the discharge policy and implementing them properly. The policies are complicated because they represent the local agreement between social care agencies and healthcare agencies who have different responsibilities. If health professionals divert from that policy, complications can occur in that people's rights are not necessarily recognised. In addition, individual families need to understand what the policy is and what the boundaries of their rights are. For that reason, it's important for everyone to understand the hymn sheet from which they're working from. Don't prejudge outcomes is such an important principle. Often a doctor will say at the very beginning, this person is to go into a home without any clear analysis of what the individual actually wants to happen to them, what their family feel is best for their relative, and indeed how they may well improve if they are given the support that they require. Therefore, we find that with imaginative planning, people may well be able to go home in a situation where that would not have been initially anticipated. And for that reason, it's very important to wait for assessment before deciding exactly what's going to happen. It's important to manage expectations from the beginning. Some patients and carers have complained that it's like playing a game where they don't know the rules. When they arrive at the hospital, they're often anxious as to what's going to happen and what the outcome may be. They may also have too high an expectation. For that reason, from the outset, the process needs to be explained so that they can understand what their role will be, how their wishes will be taken into account, and what options may be available to them in their decision making. The last of the key essentials is documenting and communicating decisions. If the process has been followed correctly, it's not a problem to write a good record of what has happened and to explain that to the patient and to the carer. Too often we see very poor records, which seem to suggest that the proper process hasn't been followed at all and decisions have been made which are rash and not evidence-based. For that reason, we would expect to see good records but that also there is evidence to show that that's been explained verbally to the patient and the carers as to how that decision has been reached. Don't forget, the seven key essentials will apply to anyone with longer term health or social care needs. It may be a younger person with a degenerative condition such as multiple sclerosis. It may be an elderly lady with a fractured femur or someone who suffered a series of strokes. Adherence to the seven key essentials means that their needs will be appropriately assessed, their rights will be respected and they'll benefit from a long-term care package. Also, don't forget to make sure you know whether the individual has the capacity to make decisions. If you suspect they may not have the capacity, don't forget the requirements of the Mental Capacity Act to determine whether or not there should be an assessment and whether or not you may need to follow the code of practice of the Mental Capacity Act. My job as Mental Health Act Manager is, uh, is really quite important from my perspective because what the Mental Health Act does is it provides safeguards for patients who are detained in hospital. Um, in this particular case, this person was detained off and on, off and on, so that's what brought me into the case. Normally, if it was somebody who had agreed to come into hospital, voluntarily or informally, then I wouldn't be involved. But because of the Mental Health Act, um, it introduced me. 
Um, the Mental Health Act is also linked, we have to think very carefully about people's human rights, it's linked very carefully with the, with the Human Rights Act or very strongly with the Human Rights Act and also with the Mental Capacity Act. Bearing in mind that I think one of the most unfortunate um, issues around the Mental Capacity Act is the use of the word mental. Um, because it's about an individual's capacity rather than somebody with mental health problems not having capacity and maybe people from the wider NHS Trust or other organisations um, don't realise how important it is to actually assess somebody's capacity before they, um, they intervene at any given time. So it's, it's, it's a much wider role, it, it is about safeguarding patients but also about safeguarding staff as well. Passing the baton promotes the belief that the patient should be at the centre of care. This is the only way to ensure that the individual's needs are understood and planned for. The day of a person's discharge or transfer of care is the culmination of careful planning by everyone involved. Close attention to detail is required so that all elements of the plan come together at the right time and are implemented smoothly. One unforeseen problem or error can potentially create long delays, preventing someone from leaving hospital. Teamwork and clear communication between health and social care professionals, patients and carers are key to a smooth and successful discharge. Achieving a successful discharge or transfer of care is dependent upon a clearly understood and managed plan of care, which is appropriately tailored to the needs of the individual. Passing the baton is about us all, patients, family members, carers, health and social practitioners at every level, having the ability to influence a person's journey through care. What passing the baton does is bring together lots and lots of aspects of little bits of training that's gone on, but most particularly unified assessment, which has been a big push over the last few years. And it kind of comes in waves and then it goes again. And it's been used variously across Wales and across this trust. Um, and, but it actually, it allows you to look at unified assessments and maybe fill it out with a little bit more knowledge so I really think that passing the baton is something that students should be taught. I think it should go into colleges. I think it should be in staff rooms, just so people pick it up in the absence of Hello Magazine and have a little flick through it, because it's, it's kind of designed for that. It's not something you'd sit and read as a big chunk. And things like care pathways, you know, it all blends into this just asking the right questions at the right time of the right person. I think that's how it's described. The aim of passing the baton is that it's there as a resource, it's there as a toolkit, it's there that, uh, that people can use on a day-to-day -day basis as they see fit, dip in and dip out of it when they feel they might need some additional bit of knowledge or they've come across a situation that they didn't necessarily feel that comfortable or confident in managing or dealing with. Uh, hopefully uh, by using it people get that bit of knowledge, that little bit of insight that helps them in the future when it comes to practice. We know passing the baton isn't going to be easy to implement, that we know that we're going to face challenges all the time just when we think we've got things set then the environment around us changes and we have to respond. The joy of passing the baton is that the principles are everlasting. That bit about human interaction, about the moral base isn't going to change because that's what's going to drive us to work every day and what people want from us stays that way. Over the past five years I've had the privilege to be cared for by some amazing people. Two of those people, Jean and Belinda, there are Jean and Belinda's all over the National Health Service. But I thought that I would need to write a letter to Jean just to say how much she meant to me and the care that she provided. So I'll share the letter with you. Dear Jean, how do I begin to tell you how much a difference you made to my care over the past two years? Now that it looks like I've finished with the trust, I feel I can write this letter. You are everything a patient needs and wants. You are what I want my students to turn out like, and you are one of the few people that make me truly proud of my profession. I give talks up and down the country on the patient experience, and the government wouldn't like to hear what I have to say about being on the receiving end of what often masquerades as care. You and Belinda shone head and shoulders above the rest, and why? Because you care. Your smile would light up even my darkest days, and God knows I had plenty of them. You reassured me when I was frightened with a blend of professionalism and humour, 
and your care for Jill, my wife, and my other relatives was second to none. I know your modesty will have you decrying this adulation as just doing your job, but unfortunately for too many, it is just a job. But to you, it's a way of life. When students ask me, what is a patient advocate? Then I need look no further than to you for the answer. You were my protector, my provider, my comforter. But most of all, you were my friend. And for these reasons, Jean, I will never, ever forget you with love and respect. Austin. I have a colleague who, when she heard about passing the baton, um, said, well, that's not really a very good process if you're just passing on the care to somebody else. And I don't think that that's what passing the baton actually is all about. I think the analogy is that it's actually like a, a relay race where whoever is best placed to be providing that care, whatever it is, that they are informed that by the, the person's needs and that the care moves along this journey, transition, if you like, between health and, and social care. And in order to effect that, it's crucial that health, social care and the voluntary sector all work together. Passing the baton provides her with a wealth of information, good practical guidance and also excellent patient case stories. It is my belief that all members or everybody who's involved in patient care can use it as a valuable tool in day-to-day -to -day practice. So the challenge is we want everyone who's watching this DVD to go away and do one thing within 24 hours that will make a difference and then to continue the pace really and keep the momentum up um, so that we create a social movement in effect. Um, if everyone who watches this goes away, puts it in practice, eventually we get to the point where this is the norm and it's not something special. And every patient who comes into contact with health and social care in Wales or in the UK can be guaranteed a good experience um, and they can feel that they are the most important person in the hospital. Mm -hmm.